Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor of being invited here, here in Ireland this week, when I think in actual fact we are seeing the first insurrection of a great counter-revolution. I should also perhaps confide to you that um, my family are converts. We converted to the faith 1,500 years ago in Inish Boffin. <laughs> in our association, we had a great privilege, Association of Catholic Families, we had a great privilege of having Bishop Snyder stay with us. In fact, he, he stayed under our roof for three, day, three nights in Walsingham. This man is a great apostle, a great bishop, well known and well called Athanasius. When he was with us, I spoke to him about an idea I had about a paper. It was a paper on the fourth revolution. The first three we will all agree on. When it comes to me presenting the evidence of the fourth, you will all have to make up your own minds. Now, this much repeated quote, it's repeated because it's important. In 1976, Cardinal Karol Wojciechowski said, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through, the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, the gospel and the anti-gospel. It was comforting when he added, this confrontation lies within the plan of divine providence. Sister Lucia, and I repeat, what has happened earlier, Sister Lucia Fatima has defined both the nature of this confrontation and the plans of divine providence. I quote, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way. That's you. In every way. Because this is the decisive issue. It sounds a tall order, but he continues, Our Lady has crushed his head. Ladies and gentlemen, note that both of these extracts, both of these quotes, implicitly speak of a sequence of confrontations against God and the family prior to the final revolution. It is of, these, of this series that I'm going to speak. The French Revolution, the October Revolution in Moscow, 1917, the 1968 sexual revolution, and the topic that Bishop Snyder wanted me to address, the fourth revolution, the apparent Vatican revolution, the culmination of all previous three. The first revolution, the French Revolution, 1789. I hope I can go this. Um, the First Revolution, 1789, French Revolution. On July the 14th, 1789, the French Revolution began with the liberating from the Bastille of seven common criminals. Not heroic rebels, seven common criminals. 
the Marquis Alphonse de Sade, who had until a few days before been in the Bastille, then became a revolutionary, advocating the total up uprooting of Christianity. That's what's happening here. The total uprooting of Christianity, claiming that blasphemy, theft, homicide, every type of sexual perversion, incest, rape, and sodomy were revolutionary achievements, which were only considered to be criminal because of the deceptions by the church. Have you in Ireland heard that one? In his novel, 120 Days of Sodom, all differences, including sexual, were to be obliterated in order to bring about primordial chaos. In another of his novels called Juliet, a man says, at 10 a.m., dressed as a woman, I want to marry a man. And at midday, dressed as a man, I want to marry a homosexual who's dressed as a woman. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is the insanity of gender theory first proposed by the sad who died in an asylum for the insane, leaving us the word sadism. What we are facing as a culture, in a word, is insanity. Incidentally, the French at the, the French Revolution, the model of all subsequent gen genocidal revolutions, exterminated 300,000 Catholics in the Vendée. This is the Marquis the Sad. Fifty-nine years later, in 1848, the Communist Manifesto, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels addressed the abolition of the family. I quote, but you say, we destroy the most hallowed of relations when we replace education by the family, by social education. The bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, about the hallowed correlation of parents and child. Yes, communism was based on the abolition of the family, our families. And it was specifically targeted on the abolition of the, did anyone notice it? Hallowed, their word, that is God-given right of parents to be the primary educators of their children. And Marxism has been consistent and the merciless enemy of our families. And like the French Revolution, it was genocidal. It cost 150 million lives. The second revolution, the October Revolution, it came 69 years later in 1917 when Marxism was exported. Marxism was exported from the West to East when, in the words of Winston Churchill, the German generals transported Lenin in a sealed truck like a plague basilisk from Switzerland into Russia. Three years later, Alexandra Kolontai, this lady, the first Soviet People's Commissar for Social Welfare wrote, and this is basic to much of what we are seeing, communist society will take upon itself all the duties involved in the education of the child. The natural family was to be replaced with a great universal socialist family. To this end, divorce was legalized in, two, in 1918, abortion 1920, and homosexuality decriminalized in 1922. It is a little known fact that the first gay pride march 
took place in 1918, when Moscow lesbians walked through Red Square with banners saying, down with shame. We are facing something that is a continuum. We have been asleep. To further destroy the family, Trotsky promoted both the extreme free love ideology of Freud's student Wilhelm Reich and the ideas of Vera Schmidt affirming infant sexuality. Does that ring any bells? We have had this bacillus go from the west to the east. The bacillus is now going to go from the east to the west. In late 1922, Lenin initiated a large meeting of experts at the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow to consider why the Bolshevik Re Revolution had not swept into Europe and America. It's of interest to see, this is the building where this took place. These aren't myths. They concluded that as long as people in Western Europe and America had hope based on the belief in God that these societies would never reach the state of hopelessness and alienation necessary for a socialist revolution. Therefore, our Judeo-Christian legacy must first be destabilized and then destroyed. Their chosen means was to be a sexual and cultural revolution which would affect man in his deepest being. This meeting is authoritatively considered to have been more harmful to Western civilization than the Bolshevik Revolution itself. I would like to mention two of its most influential thinkers, because I think these will ring bells. One, Munzeberg and Lukacs. This gentleman is Willy Munzenberg. He recommended that intellectuals be organized and used to make Western civilization stink. Because only then, with all of our values corrupted, could then, only then, could the dictatorship of the proletariat be imposed. Willi did not live to see what has been his huge success. Stalin's NKVD considered him a traitor. They hung him from a tree in Provence. The second, George Lukacs. He developed the other key idea, revolution and eros, sexual instinct used as an instrument of destruction. On Lenin's death in 1924, Stalin considered these Marxist theoreticians to be revisionists. They fled Lukacs to Frankfurt University, where he chaired the first meeting of a group of communist-orientated social scientists, which led to the foundation of the Frankfurt School. With the arrival of Hitler, the Frankfurt School was closed down. Its members then fled to the US, taking up key places in Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, and Berkeley. From these hub universities, they successfully spread their ideology of world revolution, using the vast commercial, media, academic, and academic resources of the United States. Of the two types of revolution, political and cultural, they preferred the patient, long-term, and apparently milder variety of cultural Marxism, focusing on family, sexuality, education, the media, and pop 
culture. Their intention was the total destruction of the family and therefore of society. They exploited Freud's ideas of, on pansexualism with a non-slot on, on sexual normality, undermining the specific roles of the father and the mother and the traditional relationships between men and women. Faithful to Marx, they strategically attacked the rights of parents when as primary educators and protectors of their, their children, they opposed violation of innocence, modesty, and chastity by school-based sexual and homosexual indoctrination. Political correctness is the child of the Frankfurt School. It attempts to mold language, thoughts, and behavior to conform with cultural Marxism. By declaring certain topics off limits, or even hate crimes, it endeavors to enforce a new non-Christian or rather anti-Christian morality. It constructs new words to create PC slogans of intimidation, which can be used as allegations of hate crime. The Canadian professor Jordan Peterson is outstanding for his defense of our freedom of thought. He denounces the neo-Marxist ideologues who indoctrinate indoctrinate children, indoctrinate students, that all truth is subjective, they indoctrinate that all sex differences are socially constructed, and they untruthfully demonize you people as hate-filled or even fascists. Marx's vision of the destruction of the God-given correlation of parents and child by replacing education by the family with education by the state is shared by the population lobby. I'd like to share a personal anecdote with you. I've been in this business for years and years. And many years ago, when the children were little, in the Tyrol, we went on holiday to escape all of the, the work, horrible work I'd been doing. And uh, we met up in the, high, in the high valleys with a very interesting man. I want, I want to share this anecdote with you. In 1980, I interviewed one of the permanent ecologists of the UN, a Catholic with, a Catholic with seven children, he explained to me, my area of interest, that the attack on the parent, the primary educator, was totally, totally organized. He then told me his story, and that's what I want to share with you. He had been offered the job of contraceptive and abortion motivation for the third world, big job, at the UN. He added that after the armaments industry, the contraceptive and abortion industry was then the second largest multinational in the world. This academic lawyer kept putting off taking the job in order to find out who was behind the big agenda. He was repeatedly and lavishly entertained by some of the most senior people in American industry who encouraged him to accept. They were all very senior Freemasons. Finally, he was invited to Rockefeller's house and offered a generous inducement. He turned it down. He was on a plane home, back home to Vienna within two weeks with no job and no pension. As I've said, my life's interest, really, has been in defending parents as the primary educators. The following quotations show how this largely tax-funded international birth control lobby see you. Parents, the most dangerous people of all, an FPA spokesman. 
Children have to be freed from religious and other cultural prejudices forced upon them by parents and religious authorities. Sex education should be introduced in the fourth grade, eliminating the ways of the elders, here's the punchline, by force if necessary. That was a long while ago. That was uh, in 1946, the first director of the World Health Organization. Uh, perhaps the most concise quote, it is now the privilege of the parental state to take major decisions, objective, unemotional, the state weighs up what is best for the child. That was a lady, Helen Brooks, who was the first to uh, organize the contraception for little girls behind her parents' back. Similar things are said by IPPF and by other people at the United Nations. It's very important in this time when there is so much interest in humanity to remember that in the West, the removal of parents' rights as primary educators and protectors started with the provision of contraception for children and indoctrination of children on contraception through sex education. This removal of parents' rights, which many people haven't noticed, has metastasized to include underage abortion, general medical services, school homosexual and gender theory indoctrination, and in Germany, even imprisonment of parents who exercise their God-given primary right as educators not only in Germany, but in Germany. The removal of parents' rights reached its final logical and evil culmination to the nightmare of every parent in England with the scandalous case of Alfie Evans in which the above quotation, the privilege of the parental state to take major decisions Objective, unemotional, the state weighs up what is best for the child. How brutally this was enforced. Well, we've gone through two revolutions. the third revolution, the 1968 sexual revolution. It was characterized by slogans such as, it is forbidden to forbid. The aim was the destruction of all laws and authority in the name of unrestrained sexual instinct. Are you seeing the same ideas coming through all the time? It was characterized by the wholesale acceptance of the pill and mechanical contraception facilitating widespread premarital sex, promiscuity, marital infidelity, all of which resulted in abortion on an industrial scale. Influenced by the 1952 Kinsey Report, it contributed to the homosexual revolution. Now I gave you a couple of thinkers on the Frankfurt School I'll give you two or three on the 1968 sexual revolution because I want you to know that we have been taken for a ride. This is all very, very manipulated. Herbert Marcuse, he joined the Frankfurt School in 1933. In his book, Eros and Civilization, he attempts to reduce human nature to unrestrained sexual drive. Again, like the Frankfurt School and Trotsky, he brings together Marx and Freud. Another important one is Saul Alinsky, the American transitional Marxist, who dedicated his book, Rule for Radicals, to Lucifer. He did huge damage to the American church but it is only now coming out that at the time 
of the council, he did huge damage to the universal church. Michel Foucault highlighted the relevance of the thoughts of, wait for it, the thoughts of the Marquis de Sade, 1961. And he did this in a book called Madness and Civilization, a history of insanity in the age of reason. He also wrote an archaeology of the human sciences, which is considered in, to have laid down the conceptual foundation of the so-called gay lobby. He died in 1984, reportedly from AIDS. Under Foucault's influence, the American writer Judith Butler, in her book, Gender Trouble, was one of the first to elaborate gender theory, the last frontier of the postmodern ideology of the sexual revolution. How many of our Catholic families are now living with the effects of this insanity? of the sad's insanity. But as I said, Bishop Schneider was interested in this concept of a fourth revolution, and he encouraged me to write. We've dealt with three revolutions, and we've seen they have much in common. And in light of the, the crisis that we all know about now, and in particularly in this city today, I think it's appropriate to ask, is this final confrontation between the Lord and Satan, between the gospel and, its anti -gos and the anti-gospel now taking place? Do we have the fourth revolution? I'm going to call witnesses. My first witness in this trial, Walter Cardinal Casper. Walter, did you say a Morris Laetitia will mark the start of the greatest revolution experienced by the church in 1500 years? First witness. My second witness, Cardinal Blaise Supic. Please. Did you say a Morris Letizia, a new paradigm of Catholicity, nothing short of revolutionary, moving from universal principles to concrete situations? Yes. Cardinal, Pietro Cardinal Parolin, I have a question for you. Did you say a Morris Letizia is a paradigm of change and the text insists on it? See. An anonymous cardinal to the Italian press, four years of Bergoglio would be enough to change things. I can't ask him because he was anonymous. And here's another guy that I really wouldn't want to speak to. Ex-Cardinal McCarrick. Interesting man. This gentleman has boasted about how he actively helped with the candidature of his friend, Cardinal Bergoglio. After a brilliant, influential, and unnamed man made this proposal. Bergoglio could reform the church. If we gave him five years, he could put us back on target. Notice that on target. In five years, we could make the church over again. Cardinal Maradiaga, I want to ask you a question. Eminence, did you say the Second Vatican Council meant an end to the hostilities between the church and modernism? See. In short contrast, when Cardinals Burke, 
Kefara, Meisner, Brunmuller, asked the Pope to clarify his position and that of the church on matters relating to marriage and the family, etc. He refused, causing Cardinal Burke to accuse Pope Francis of increasing the confusion in the church. Cardinal Muller, also of the Catholic party, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is, in contrast, our paradigm, which we will not exchange for any other, nor will we, ladies and gentlemen. Given that cardinals of both parties, the Catholic and the Revolutionary parties, agree that a paradigm shift on marriage and the family, a revolution, appears to be happening, is this the final greatest historical confrontation between the church and the, and the anti-church, the gospel and the anti-gospel? Frankly, do we, are we at this moment seeing an attempt at a Vatican revolution, which would be the culmination and fulfillment of all three previous revolutions. To answer this, it would be perhaps helpful to look at the evidence using the, you look at the evidence using the indices of marriage, contraception, abortion, population control, homosexualism, and parental rights. And I will now address each of these topics, and I will move from the cardinals to leave you to be the jury. Marriage. I make two points. Firstly, in his groundbreaking interview on the flight from Rio, a terribly important interview, Pope Francis made a cryptic but significant reference to orthodox marriage discipline. I quote, they follow the theology of what they call economia, and they give a second chance. Second quote from Cardinal Burke. If a person who is living publicly in violation of his or her marriage, marriage bond, is admitted to the sacraments, then either marriage is not indissoluble or the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is not the body of Christ. You are hearing that from a holy cardinal. Second index, contraception. In an interview with Father Spodaro, Pope Francis said, we cannot insist only on issues related to the use of contraceptive methods. I've not spoken much about these things. It's not necessary to talk about these issues all the time. In 2017, Pope Francis set up a committee to authoritatively study Humani Vitae under Monsignor Marengo. In his book on the encyclical, Monsignor Marengo describes a previously completed and printed version of Humani Vitae. It had another name, but it was Humani Vitae. And Marenko described it as a rigorous pronunciation of moral doctrine. He explained that as a result of criticism, the pastoral tone and language of the encyclical was modified by Pope Paul to be less in conflict with the dominant thinking of the time. I'm old enough to remember what the dominant thinking of the time was. It was much influenced by Paul Ehrlich's apocalyptic and later to be discredited book, The Population Bomb. In vain did Cardinal Karol Wojcicki appeal to Pope Paul to clearly reaffirm the dogmatic authority of Humani Vitae, that is, 
that the ban on contraception is infallible. Monsignor Marengo's book goes on to appear to relativize human naivety, making it appear a part of an evolving teaching to be read in the light of Pope Francis's Amoris Laetitiae. Subsequently, Father Maurizio Chiodi, a new member of the Reformed Pontifical Academy for Life, or one, one might say purged Pontifical Academy for Life, has said in a public lecture at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome that there are circumstances, I refer to Pope Francis and Morris Laetitia, chapter 8, that precisely for the sake of responsibility require contraception. But I, as a family doctor, ask, how, how can it be that we mustn't speak, speak much about these things? Do we not know that uh, there was an est there's been an estimated 350 to 750 million chemical abortions alone in the United States as a result of the abortifacy nature of the pill? Do we not know that the fact that the interruption of pregnancy by administration of estrogen was first reported in 1926, 42 years before Humani Vitae. Think of that and think of the people who were studying all of this. Did they not know of the fact that the disastrous procrastination over the publication of Humani Vitae rapidly ended when four theologians convinced Pope Paul VI that the oral contraceptive had an abortifacient mode of action. And that was very well known to people of my vintage from the pharmacology textbooks in the early 60s. I fear we are seeing an ill-concealed Ill -concealed attempt to empty Humani Vitae of its absolute prohibition of contraception. I ask myself, where is the newfound momentum for the removal of the essential procreative element of sexual intercourse coming from? It's certainly not coming from married couples. That, was, that battle was lost when I was a young doctor. Might it not be that some in the Vatican welcome the removal of procreation, which is one of the main obstacles to the moral legitimization of homosexuality. Third indicator index, abortion. In a formal interview with Father Spodaro, Pope Francis has said, we cannot insist only on issues related to abortion. I've not spoken much about these things. It's not necessary to talk about these things all the time. Proclamation in a missionary style focuses on the essentials, on the necessary things. In another interview, he spelt out what they were. The most serious of the evils that afflict the world these days are youth unemployment and loneliness in the old. Pope Francis has called Emma Bonino Italy's foremost abortion promoter, one of the nation's forgotten greats. And I think we've got to speak about these things, all of us. Because in the real world, which we can't escape, 1.7 billion little boys and little girls, the population of India is 1.3 billion, 1.7 billion little boys and little girls have been decapitated, dismembered, and eviscerated by surgical abortion. But Pope Francis insists that he has not spoken much about these things. Alas, after your abortion referendum, after, Pope Francis said, last century, the whole world was scandalized by what the Nazis did to purify the race. 
Today, we do the same thing with white gloves. After. Population control. The Pontifical Academy for Sciences and Pontifical, two of the Pontifical Academies for Science have endorsed the United Nations proposed sustainable development goals. Goal 4D ensures the universal right to sexual and reproductive health. That is, of course, UN speak for worldwide legalization of abortion on demand and access for children to abortion and contraception without parental knowledge or consent. Bishop Sarondo, the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Science, has said, his English isn't very good, but he said this, because, because when you have education, we don't have children. We don't have seven children. Maybe we have one child, two children, no more. He also said it is legitimate for the state to intervene to orient the demography of the population. Pope Francis himself has said that population experts advise three children per family. Bishop Sarondo's work has allegedly been celebrated by Ted Turner, the billionaire media mogul. Turner is reported to have told journalists he would like to reduce the world's population by five billion, asking parents to be one-child families for a hundred years. Oh, we may laugh at this. Dangerous to laugh at these people. Very dangerous not to take these people seriously. Very dangerous. Good people like yourselves just cannot conceive of the evil that they intend. Bishop Saronda has invited the elite of the population movement to participate in the work of his academy. For example, Paul Ehrlich, Stephen Sachs, who has said, abortion is a lower risk and lower cost option than bringing a human life into the world. May have got my picture a bit out of order. Let me see. Oh, that's that's Foucault. That's the lady who talks uh, about gender theory. And here we have two of the people who are invited to um, these pontifical academies: Sachs, Ban Ki Moon, very pro-abortion, population control. And who is that? Soros's hand is written over all of this. We must stop being naive. Next indicator, the Vatican uh, homosexualism. On the flight back from Rio, four months into his pontificate, Patricia Zorzan, a journalist, asked, in Brazil, a law, asked the Pope, in Brazil, a law has been approved which has allowed matrimony between persons of the same sex. Why didn't you speak about this? Pope Francis answered, the church has already expressed herself perfectly on this. Patricia Zorzan, but it's an issue that interests young people. Pope Francis Yes, but it wasn't necessary to talk about this. Patricia Zorzan, what is the position of your holiness? Can you tell us? Pope Francis, that of the church. I'm a child of the church. Another journalist asked, I'm speaking about this because the homosexual aspect of this is very important. I would like permission to ask a delicate question. Another image that has been going around the world is that of Monsignor Rica and the news about his private life. I would like to know, Your Holiness, what do you intend to do about this? How are you confronting the issue and how does Your Holiness intend to confront the whole question of the gay lobby? Pope Francis. If someone is gay and is searching for the Lord, 
and has good will, then who am I to judge? Tell that to the people of Pennsylvania. Bob Chile. This is a, I mentioned this Monsignor Rica, who was the instigator of this slogan, who am I to judge, he's, he's, when he was brought up in the airplane, and that is Pope Francis with Monsignor Rica. Subsequently, Monsignor Rica was appointed as the Vatican Bank's prelate ad interim. Some judgment was made. Juan Carlos Cruz, a tragic Chilean victim of clerical sexual abuse, had said that Pope Francis told him, Juan Carlos, that you are gay does not matter. God made you like this and loves you like this, and I don't care. This gentleman, some of you recognize, funny habit, is Cardinal Daniels, who was personally appointed by Pope Francis to the Synod of the Family in 2013. A very controversial man. He has said, I think it's a positive development that states are free to open up civil marriages for gays if they want. Another person close to Pope Francis is Cardinal Casper, who gave the address launching the Synod on the family. Launching. Speaking of your country, he said, if the majority of the people want such homosexual unions, the state has a duty to recognize such rights. Forgive me this one. Forgive me, you can close your eyes if you like. Pope Francis named Archbishop Pallia to lead and then purge the Pontifical Academy for life. Bishop Pallia had previously had himself depicted clutching a semi-naked man in his cathedral in a homoerotic, homoerotic mural in his cathedral. You can see him with his brown hat on. Pope Francis uh, um, the thing about this that most offends me is that th this mural faces directly on the Blessed Sacrament. That makes me enraged. Now get away from this unpleasant man. Cardinal Cupic, when told that Bishop Paprosky had instructed his priest not to give Holy Communion to lesbians and homosexuals in same-sex marriages, answered that this was not his policy. Pope Francis subsequently named him Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. A very brave lady, Kim Davis, Baptist, gained international attention when she courageously defied a US federal court to or court order to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. The United States Nuncio invited her to meet Pope Francis. Photographs were forbidden. The Vatican confirmed that the, this meeting only with great reluctance, stating that the only real audience granted by the Pope at the Nunciature was, one, was with one of his former students and his family. Here we have a photograph of part of them. This gentleman was called Grassi. He was a former student of Pope Francis. Grassi's sister and mother were present. Who is the other gentleman? That is Grassi's homosexual partner. 
This poor Baptist lady wasn't allowed a photograph. There were videos and photographs taken of this. In October 2016, Pope Francis referred to a woman who underwent a sex change operation as a man. He referred to her as having married another woman and admitted to inviting, and I think paying for, I'm not sure of that, but I believe it is, inviting and receiving them to the Vatican in 2015, describing the couple or the pair, as someone called, as happy. Clarifying his use of pronouns, the Pope said, he that was her, but is he. <laughs> Couldn't make it up. It's, it's really insane. I mean, the Marquis, the sad, would be cheering him on. Here we have a picture. Now, I gather the lady with the moustache is the man. <laughs> but, you know, you know, this influences the media, it influences the general Catholic on throughout the world. But when he was asked to comment on Italy's same-sex civil union legislation, he refused, saying, because the Pope is for everybody, and he can't, can't insert himself in the, specific, in the speci specific internal politics of a country. Do you know any other country in which that's happened? Well, I think I know maybe three or four. Final index, you'll be glad. In chapter one of Amoris Laetitiae, Pope Francis strongly, and in a general sense, supports the primary right of the parent. Very good. But a hundred pages later, in the Italian edition, he gives the clarion call. Si, all'educazione sessuale. Yes, to sex education. And in the English edition, the more restrained the need for sex education. On the great and urgent need to defend parents' rights as primary educators on the critical area of sexual education, that's right, silence. And on chastity, same noise, silence. However, in 2014, Pope Francis did speak of this virtue, surprisingly enough, in the European Parliament. I quote, keeping democracy alive in Europe requires avoiding the many globalizing tendencies to dilute reality. Namely, angelic forms of purity, dictatorship of relativism, etc. So what do you, a Catholic parent, do when you want to withdraw your child from sex classes? What do you do when the child says, but uh, Pope Francis wants me to have sex education? What do you do? In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis deals with sustainable development, an issue very closely aligned to the population lobby. Again, on the parent, the primary educator who needs to be protected from these people, silence. In two, um, also, uh, in 2016, there was a, the Vatican hosted a workshop on using children in schools, using your grandchildren in schools. They don't own them. They've usurped them, using your grandchildren in schools to promote the strategic development goals, which will remove your rights. On this occasion, the silence was finally broken. The briefing paper for the workshop warned against the opposition of religious parents. The meeting in the Vatican warned against you. The 
It all becomes more disturbing when one remembers that Pope Francis led 300,000, a third of a million, young people in repeatedly chanting the slogan, it takes a village to raise a child, which is the title of Hillary Clinton's book on her vision of the state rather than parents looking after their children. But St. John Paul, and much of this is about St. John Paul and Familiaris Consortio, but St. John Paul has taught the perennial teaching of the church. Since parents have conferred life on their children, they have the original, primary, and inalienable right to educate them. That's from St. John Paul's Charter of the Rights of the Family, and I doubt if 5% of you here have ever heard of it. From Familiaris Consortio, which you will know of, the rights and duties of parents to give education is incapable of being usurped by others. Again, sex and familiaris consortio, sex education, which is a basic right and duty of parents, must always be carried out under their attentive guidance. In this regard, the church reaffirms a law of subsidiarity. There was a massive amount in John Paul on the parent, the primary educator especially on sex. He also says parents have the right to ensure that their children are not compelled to attend classes which are not in agreement with their own moral and religious convictions, in particular sex education. Ladies and gentlemen, because of Amoris Letizia and the deeply disturbing possibility of a revision of Giovanni Vitae, a few questions must be asked. One, and this is my own particular area of of interest, has in the field of sexuality the teaching of the church on the right of the parent, the primary educator, been revoked? And if so, who will protect millions of Catholic children from indoctrination by the wolves in the population and homosexualist lobbies? And they are powerful allies very powerful allies in the Vatican. Where will your grandchildren hide? Oh, this is all much more depressing than sisters talk. Much terrible talk. So I repeat my question. Is there a Vatican revolution? You are the jury. You make up your minds. But to reassure you a little, When Napoleon claimed that he would destroy the church in a few years, Cardinal Ercole Cansalvi replied, Sire, if in 1800 years the priests haven't managed it, (laughs) how will you? (laughs) Dear Irish friends, dear parents and grandparents, you are at the front line in this providential, decisive battle between the Lord and Satan. The holiness of your marriages and your children's marriages and their families is being opposed in every way in this country. But you're not alone. If I as a foreigner may make an observer or an observation, your referenda have shown that in spite of huge international pressures and huge clerical betrayal that every third man and woman in Ireland is with you in the fight. That's a lot. But above all, the mother of God is with you in the fight. Do not be afraid. The people who are your enemies in this country should be afraid. You are still here. You have a third of the population with you. You have the Queen of Heaven with you. What we are seeing today is the beginning of a counter-revolution.
Thank you for being given the privilege of coming and meeting you. And praise be Jesus Christ. <laughs>